Well, I think this is a film. I mean, I was extremely, in, uh, what's it called? The emergency was, a, was, in a sense, the moment when I cut my political teeth. You know, I mean, I became someone who was precipitated into uh, having to perform, uh, uh, become part of larger movements, a little bit like the way in which things are happening around in Bangalore now. Um, and so uh, that was a moment, but it also uh, tied with the fact that uh, uh, Snehla Teredi, uh, who is a Bangalore-based person, is someone I kind of resonated with a lot because I had spent eight years of my life in, in, uh, in Bangalore, critical years, because I went to college here and I went and I actually studied law. Uh, so I had these eight years in, in Bangalore. And I got to know a lot of uh, uh, Bangalore and its, um, you know, uh, its, its general sense of uh, engagement with uh, the arts and theatre and so on. So I think one of the things that um, uh, I got to uh, um, sort of engaging with quite early uh, was the sense of the history. And I used to cycle around here. So, you know, one cycled around past... Uh, past uh, Snehla Teredi's house on St. Mark's Road. It was a very, uh, it was a big uh, site. <laughs> and you had to, if you went to um, Brigade Road, uh, sorry, uh, if you went to Parade, uh, Mahatma Gandhi Road, you had to go past that place and so on. So that was a, a sense that one had of, uh, of the place. And then Snehla Teredi was the, and as later on as the emergency unfolded, Snehla Teredi became the only person who kind of paid a certain dramatic price for the fact that she was political and she was incarcerated. Now, everybody else came out and uh, at the end of the 19 months and um, also made a successful political careers for themselves. But in a sense, Snehla Teredi became the icon of uh, what uh, a repressive regime can do to you uh, because uh, she's the only one who actually, in a sense, became, quote unquote, a martyr to the uh, cause of uh, standing up politically to a repressive regime. So in a sense, um, the combination of factors uh, meant that uh, one of the themes that I had to explore as part of my general exploration of state and uh, state's uh, repressive uh, articulation was that phase and particularly then in Bangalore. So that's how this film happened as uh, a film located around Snehla Taredi's prison time. See, one of the things that I became involved with uh, as I uh, began to explore um, uh, history from the standpoint of uh, a feminist standpoint, I naturally gravitated towards, uh, you know, sort of uh, exploring the lives of women. Uh, and because I was, I had had this experience with becoming political myself, it became questions of exploring the lives of women who became political themselves, uh, crossed a certain boundary and then came into the ambit of the, the eye of the state as it were. So I began to do interviews uh, with, with people who had been, uh, who actually have to, had to take on, uh, have to become, have been targeted by the state for their politics. Now, one of the things that uh, Snehla Tere says in this, uh, in the film, and I try to capture that, uh, she doesn't say it, but her daughter recounts it, is that um, she was the only woman in the Bangalore jail when uh, a whole series of well-known uh, emergency uh, prisoners was in the Bangalore Central Jail at the same time. You see? So it had, it had, uh, Advani was here, uh, a lot of them were here, but they were a gang. Um, I think even uh, Ramakrishna Hegde, whole series of political figures were all there. But she was the only woman, and they would not let her go and meet even her uh, her compatriots in the jail because they thought it was not going to be safe for her. So, in a sense, it's you know, it's all that comes back as the unique experience of women in a political sphere also. You see, the core of the work always at the, the starting point. I, I learned quickly, fairly early that you can do, um, uh, you, you do interviews and you speak to people who are major protagonists of the 
uh, of the time that you're trying to capture. So in a sense, the interviews with people became something uh, as, as a process through which I could begin to explore a particular time. So uh, doing the interviews in this case meant, because Snehalata was gone, uh, it meant doing interviews with her close, uh, uh, and I started only thinking about the children because it was their experiences that, uh, in a sense, through whom I could access Snehalata Reddy. And then I knew that, you know, you also have to go proceed uh, to the next step, uh, is to see anyone else in the name, in, around her. And by a coincidence, coincidence, I actually managed to capture Deepa Dhanraj in the film, whose uh, husband was doing the camera work for one of the segments of the film, okay. And it turned out that she became an extremely important person because she had, she was close to Sneha, Sneha Reddy, and she was actually someone who uh, has also been taken very strong political stance herself in her, in, not only in her camera, in her own films, but also in the, um, in the fact that you have to, uh, in your times, you have to take a stand, like the recent film that she's made on Rohit Vemula. So, uh, so she's another person, and she didn't want to be interviewed. <laughs> I had to sort of persuade her to come on board, and I did this interview. And I think all of that, so the interviews became critical. And I got only four people in, in the, as far as the interviews was concerned. But then it's very important to get the B-roll. And I learned early enough that the B-roll is actually makes, is, is what the, makes the film. And so it's at that stage when I decided that, okay, I'm going to make this film on, on Sneha uh, that I went off and did the prison shoot. And fortunately, the prison is no longer a prison. Uh, and it's actually called Freedom Park in a strange twist of irony. But it was available as a space. And I think I was able to capture uh, something of the prison ambience uh, through all of that. So I, uh, sort of, in a sense, the film gets crafted around what seems to me, for, for me at least, be the core of the venture, which is my conversations with people. And then the film leads off from that. You know, when I first, I did a first draft of the film, a first cut, and I sent it off to uh, Deepa to have a look at, and I tried to send it to various people, all the people who were in the film. Nobody else watched it. Uh, Kirtana did. Kirtana watched it and gave me some feedback. But Deepa's feedback was interesting. She said, why aren't you putting yourself into the film? <laughs> and I couldn't bring myself to put, I was in the, I was very much there in the questions I was asking. Uh, but I did finally find a way to put myself into the film, and it was through my relationship with Roma, Roma Mitra. Uh, and in a sense, that brought in how I first heard of Sneha's incarceration and the prison diaries itself, which is actually quite extraordinary, because nobody else that I know of has written a diary while they are in jail. You know, they write afterwards. But this is quite extraordinary. So she actually flags the days and flags the way in which she's experiencing her incarceration. So it's an extraordinary uh, diary. And by the way, all of it has not been fully published. So the diary itself includes only a few, uh, excerpts from the uh, And I think it's an extraordinary archive. And so uh, since I'm so interested in the archive also, there's a way in which all of that. So I am there in all of those ways. It's absolutely true. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because because of the internet explosion, there's a lot that is circulating on the um, on the internet, um, on YouTube, and all of this. And since I'm making other films, and they're all of them now are around political events and women who've uh, been to jail for their work, uh, for their political work. There's a lot uh, of um, need for actually constructing their times. Now, you won't believe it, but there's nothing on the emergency at the time of the emergency. There's only those couple of clips, two or three clips that uh, Arun Patwardhan uses and which I have used in some of my films. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing over there. The only thing that exists, and this is quite extraordinary, it's not the emergency so much, but for Nakshal Bari, for instance. The internet, uh, the internet can't help you, okay? Uh, because it was a, because it was a, oppositional 
uh, regime, there isn't even good, nobody did footage. One of my protagonists told me that she couldn't, there were no photographs. They, it was dangerous to keep photographs. So even photographs would disappear, you know, I mean, they, they were not allowed to keep them. So she has no visual um, uh, remnants of her own time. And that's a very interesting uh, thing. The only thing that exists now for, uh, uh, for Bengal at that time is a Louis Mal footage. And it brings in all this copyright stuff. It, by the way, that film, uh, that, that footage was, that film was never allowed to be released. It was banned in its own time. It's there on the internet and it's extraordinary material. But there's, you know, all this uh, dynamic around it, which is like, how do you get hold of the thing? But I have, uh, I, for, uh, I have been able to use uh, some of the newspaper archives and the photographs taken during the, uh, during those times, but there is nothing by way of, uh, um, let's say, film material that I can access for that uh, period. So in a sense, it's a huge loss. Now, in contrast, there is an explosion at this point of time. So if like everybody's making a video and posting it, um, actually when you're starting to make a film, you'll have to go to that uh, videoed stuff and seek to use it and then get permission if you can and whatever it is. But it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's lucky for us that we have this material. But I think it's still, it's like, um, it's a challenge to be able to generate the, the sentiment and the feeling that you're also trying to access. You know, not everything is uh, available and not everyone comes and speaks to you and so on. So there's still, there's, oral interviews will still remain a very important way of archiving your own time, which is why I'm so obsessed with the oral interviews. Yeah, you know, see, see, it's, uh, it was also tied to, uh, I think that question that I was asking, how does that emergency moment happen? It's the first lead question that I'm asking her. And she has just been through the uh, recounting, uh, because it, you go back and forth in an interview, okay? So we've already discussed the certain character, certain elements of her own memory and her own experience, uh, her own recall of what has happened. And then I ask her for that precise question about when does the emergency, how does that emergency moment happen? And she has to kind of shake herself, if you notice. She shakes herself and then she, then she says, well, the film, uh, uh, the day that emergency was imposed is the day in which my father's other film was completed. So in a sense, you get elements of her, whatever it is, uh, different bits of her life and her mother's life coming together at that moment. And so, but it's not one in which you actually capture her breaking down, but actually beginning to tell her story after that moment of whatever it is. So I think we, you try and do the, you don't want it to be, see, I, I am an emotional person and I'm quite happy to make it emotional. What we have to avoid is to make it sentimental. So that's, that is a choice that you have to always make with your, uh, with your um, uh, editors and your, uh, by and large, my editors uh, sometimes also shoot me down. Like if I'm trying to be emotional, they'll, you know, just cut it <laughs> at that point and say, no, no, we don't want too much emotion. And I have to sometimes argue and say, no, let's keep this one. And there was, there was a film I made in which um, the last film, this is fragments uh, of a past in which there's a last scene in which the daughter is crying when she was singing that song. And of course, my uh, editors did not want me to have it. And I said, no, we should, because that's, she's crying not only for the comrades who are dead, but she's, she's actually crying for the, her mother, the comrade, who's no longer there. So it's a very important uh, moment. So, you know, I, I do have some arguments with my, with my and sometimes I have my way. <laughs> I had some moments which were very interesting. I first got entry when I first came to Bangalore and I was trying to shoot. Nandana was not in town. And so I managed to meet Konarak. Okay. Uh, and of course, he was a musician and he was uh, whatever. So then I had this, uh, I, I, since I am emotional, <laughs> I asked him this question. Did you, and I knew that, you know, Snehalata from the, from the, uh, 
diary, one knows that she's very moved by, she's ex extremely, yeah, yeah she's, there's a lot of anguish because he's going off. And he's this 17 year old child, boy and he's going off and whatever it is. So I uh, knew that there was a lot of feeling uh, in that moment and I also thought to myself that it must have impacted Konarak a lot because he wasn't here when she died. But then I, uh, I, mm, he was such a, he was such a, uh, what would you call it, he was so generous with his, uh, uh, with his responses. So then I asked him this question, did you ever write something specially for your mother? And he said, yes I did. And then he says, it's a song that's called Sneha and I first heard it. And I said, will you play it for us? And he played it for us. So then it's like, it's an extraordinary moment as far as I'm concerned. In filmmaking, in the crafting of the film and then in using it and then that became, his music became the kind of, the soul of the, 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 the let's say the oral soul of the film comes from his playing of the whatever. So that's something that I feel uh, really shaped the film in the end.